Five, four, three, two, one. Let's go. Diary of a Kidney Warrior podcast in partnership with Kidney Care UK, sharing faith, knowledge, hope, and love. Hi, and welcome to Diary of a Kidney Warrior podcast. My name is Dee Moore, and I am a kidney warrior. This podcast is dedicated to encourage, educate, and inspire as we explore all aspects of kidney disease, related chronic illnesses, and health. If you have any questions or ideas for topics you would like me to cover, please get in contact with me on social media using the handle Diary of a Kidney Warrior. In today's episode, I'm bringing you a kidney warrior story. Now there's always something you can learn from someone's story, something that can bring inspiration and hope. My guest today from Houston, Texas, USA, is realtor and mother of two boys, Sunette Kasai. Sunette joins me to share about her sudden diagnosis of kidney failure, dialysis, transplantation, and the lessons she has learned along her kidney warrior journey. Hi, and welcome to Diary of a Kidney Warrior podcast. How are you doing today, Sunette? Hi, Dee. I am well, thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm really good. I'm looking forward to hearing your kidney warrior story. And you know what I'm going to say? Because I say every time, I always enjoy recording kidney warrior story interviews because, as I've said many times before, it is so valuable learning from someone's lived experience with CKD. There's so much that you can learn and so much that can be so inspiring and helpful. So, Yeah, I'm really looking forward to our interview today. Well, thank you for having me here and giving me the opportunity to share my story. I love to share whoever I can help and inspire. Wonderful, wonderful. So I'm going to start with my first question. And my first question is, how did your kidney warrior journey begin and how were you diagnosed? So I grew up in Saudi Arabia. I was there for my more than 20 years. When I was 14, my mother at that time, she started noticing my thirst, going to the toilet plenty of times during the day. She knew those symptoms. I had no idea. She took me to get checked. The doctor told me that my Sugar at that time was 666. What? Yeah. Wow. It was very high because I also remember before that when I was getting thirsty, I wasn't drinking much of water. I was having other juices and, you know, all that adds up to the sugar. So I was 14. That's when I got diagnosed with diabetes. And then I lived with it until I was... About in 2020, maybe 32, I guess. And this is when I knew. So I educated myself of more symptoms that I need to, to be looking out for after having diabetes, which is the eye problems, your limbs, your kidneys. And we were on vacation at that time, my husband with his family. And I noticed I was gaining weight. I thought I was gaining weight, but I was swelling my face, my body, and I was getting tired, not doing much of activities. We came to the States that time in 2020. I was with my son, the little one, and I didn't want to go to the hospital. I knew I needed to go, but I had to wait for my mother to come. I asked her to come and help me with my children. And she came, that's when I went to the hospital to check. And they told me that my kidney was failing, stage five. So I had to be on dialysis. Wow. So you are what we call a crash lander. So you were diagnosed immediately in kidney failure and went straight on to dialysis. Mm -hmm. That must have been an absolute shock to the system. To the system and to me, it was a whole lot of shock. They told me you need to be on dialysis like right now. But I said, I need time to process it in my head. 
and to be okay and accept the fact that I am going to be starting dialysis. Um, I think it took me about 20 days or so to process it and say, okay, let me start dialysis. In those 20 days, what was going Mm -hmm. through your mind? What was that process for you that you were going through? The same was continuing me being tired. I knew my body was not like the swelling was not going to get better. I had to find a way to to be better, to be able to at least, you know, get back to my energy. And I was processing in my head, convincing myself, like, Sanet, this is what you need to do in order to be okay for now. And then we will see what we can do after that. So I was just maybe taking it one step at a time. So working through that process and coming to terms with the fact that you had to start dialysis on your life as you knew it was going to change. How was the process of then starting dialysis? I had to be hospitalized for maybe, I think it was three days in the hospital. And that's, you know, first they have to take you for surgery, to do the incisions, to put the catheter in. I remember not crying one bit because I was still in shock that I am going through this. You know, when you're shocked, you don't cry. (laughs) So yeah, I was there for two or three days. They had to see how my body was reacting to dialysis. They had to put me under supervision to see how everything was reacting in my body. So all those three days, I was seeing what was the new things that was my body was being introduced to. And at that time, it was, okay, Senate, this is it. This is how it is going to be for a while. You have no choice. You have to do it. And, you know, God, you know, things get better after that. So that was the process. It was all about just talking to myself. As I said, the surgery was happening and they were just supervising to see how my body reacts to it. It was a smooth, it was okay. Like I didn't have any bad reactions at that time. It's quite incredible that after hearing the news, getting that shock diagnosis and delaying Some would say a very long time, given the fact that you were in kidney failure and that anyone listening might just sound like, how on earth does that happen? But you have to put yourself in the shoes of somebody getting shock news. And Mm. it really does take people different amount of times to come to terms with what's happening to them. And for you, it took that amount of time. And really relieved and happy to hear that the process of dialysis started off really well. But I want to go back to looking at that initial shock and what it does to your thought process and and how you see yourself. And so for anyone listening who may themselves had a shock diagnosis, what advice would you give to them? The advice I can give from my experience is I know I took a few, not even a few, a way longer time to process it being that my kidney is failing. I don't advise that you take that long time to process it. But if you need some time to process it in your head, you should have those couple of days because at that point, we don't have a choice. We need to do it and we need to accept it. And you go in with positive thinking and good spirits. I know very well it's not an easy process or an easy change to your lifestyle. But when something is given to you in front of you and you have no choice but to take it for you to be okay until you know to live for another week or another year, just take it, process it and go with good spirits because always tomorrow can be better than today. So you started hemodialysis and for those who don't know, if you suddenly start on hemodialysis, you have to have a line fitted to do the dialysis through. But some people will then elect to have what's called a fistula, which is where they connect an artery in a vein to create a super vein. 
And then this is what dialysis is done through. So for yourself, did you opt to have a fistula or did you continue with the catheter? I did not. I remember the time period that I was on dialysis. I think it was about a year and eight months. I have had doctors come to me about three or four times (laughs) and telling me to put fistula, but I refused. I did not want to do it, even though they told me the side effects of a catheter. When it's longer, I think they said when it's longer than six or nine months, it creates other problems. But I was very positive that I knew I wasn't going to stay longer in dialysis. I had that feeling and I just took it. I rejected the idea of a fistula because I knew that if I had the transplant, I will still live with my arm being different or looking different. Yeah, I didn't want to be in that kind of position later on in my life. So it was what a fistula looks like that really made that decision for you? The appearance and going for another surgery. Yeah. Just the idea of connecting veins. And that's also another change that happens into your arm or whether it's your thigh, wherever the position might be. But the whole process, I just didn't see it with me or for me. I can absolutely understand and relate to you feeling that way. At this point in time, I don't have a fistula myself and I have very similar feelings towards fistulas. But I mean, it's an individual choice and and people have to decide Mm -hmm. what's right for them as an individual. And this was what was right for you in your circumstance. Correct. Yes. So you mentioned that you felt that you'd get a transplant soon. So you did go on to have a transplant. So tell me how that came about. So I started dialysis in March of 2020, and I got my transplant October 2022. So not very long (laughs) compared to a lot of people that I have seen. It was a beautiful transition. They called me, you know, it's a phone call. It's either you come, you show up or you lose your position in that list of transplant patients. They called me one time. I remember I was sitting in the living room watching a movie with my kids and it was, I think, 6 p.m. She called me, my nurse at that time, and she said, we have a kidney, but Let me call you back to see if, you know, they run tests with that kidney too, if everything is okay. She said they're doing the tests currently, but it doesn't take long because it's a quick process. I will call you back and assure you of everything and then you can make your way here. So I was waiting for that call. I, All kinds of feelings and emotions were running, but she called me maybe like, 40 minutes later, and she said, no, sorry, it failed one test. I said, okay, that's fine. At least, you know, I don't get a wrong kidney. After that, I think it was two weeks after, it wasn't even long, two weeks, she called me, she said, okay, everything is good. I need you to come here right now. And I went to my mother. She was upstairs in her room. We cried about it. I was scared. It's, you know, it's not, it's a very, it's either you're shocked, you're scared, you're afraid, all kinds of emotions. But I went, I remember driving was a 45 minute drive to that transplant hospital. We had to stop twice because I was throwing up. This is all me, my stomach (laughs) going upside down because I'm nervous. But we got there. It took about A whole 24 hours to run tests again on me to make sure that everything was good to go. And they did. So one thing about me that I didn't mention is I had a kidney and a pancreas. Pancreas is the organ for insulin. So my diabetes was going to be gone and my kidney was going to come to function. So anyways, going back to the kidney, yes, after the next day, it was about 24 hours later, we went for the surgery. 
that took around four hours. And I came out okay. Of course, the anesthesia was still going, but I woke up. It's a struggle. It's crazy. But it was it was good. The pancreas was given to me at that time too. But the pancreas stayed for two days and my body rejected it. Yeah. So they had to go back for another surgery and take the pancreas out. So you had the failure of one organ, but the success of the other. So that really must be like, on one hand, you're celebrating the fact that your kidney has been successful. But on the other hand, you've got that devastation of losing the pancreas. So how did you get your mind around all of that? Oh, I was fine. I was thanking God because if my pancreas was good and my kidney failed, that would have been devastating for me. I remember the pain is ridiculous when your body rejects an organ. It is horrible, horrible, horrible. Nothing. They gave me anti whatever the medications was, but nothing was working. So the doctor came. He said, sorry, I was late. But your blood sugar, this is what's going on. So your body is rejecting the pancreas. I said, let's just go and take it out. He's like, you're okay? I said, I'm fine. I would have been devastated if it was the opposite. He's like, okay, let's go. Maybe you can come back in a year and do the pancreas. I said, okay, let's just go right now and take it out. I was fine. I was blessed. And my family said, like, are you you're okay. They looked at me. I'm like, I am fine. I'm good. As long as I don't get back to dialysis. Yeah. How was the recovery after your surgery? I think I was in the hospital for about eight, eight or nine days. The recovery was crucial. It wasn't easy. I don't even know the words to describe the recovery, but it was crucial. There's tubes There was a tube from my nose. There was a tube from, what is it called in English, from down under, that's for your urine. We call it a catheter as well. Catheter, (laughs) yes. Your, you know, your stomach pain is hard because they had to cut me twice. So it was very crucial. But, you know, staying positive through it all is what is needed. And I wasn't able to walk until like the fourth or fifth day to get up from the bed and walk. That's when they, yeah, that's when they try, they test you to do all of that. Did the kidney work straight away or did it take time? No, thank God it worked straight away. They did tell me it's either it's going to quickly just pick up and work. And they said it can take a day or two to slowly get working. But they said, your kidney is working straight away, which I was relieved about because hearing that from them after taking the pancreas out was very crucial for me to hear. So how has your life changed since receiving the kidney? Staying out of dialysis is very huge. I'm sure everyone going through kidney failure knows what I am saying. Just not being, not going to dialysis, not taking away the energy that I had. Everything was nice. I saw life. It's like another chance of life that you're getting. But you see things differently. What I eat, the amount of water I drink, the exercise that I need to be doing. The only downside of transplant is the medications. That's for life. But anything beats dialysis. Anything that can happen can be seen in a better way than dialysis. My life changed. I have energy to be with my two boys. I have energy to work just to do normal functions. Because when I was doing dialysis, my energy was very down. And my appetite is better. And yeah, that's it. There's no downside of after transplant except just the medications, the the amount of medications that you take for the rest of your life. Talking about the medication side of it. So when someone has a transplant, they're given anti-rejection tablets. These are the tablets 
that the person must take for the rest of their life so that the organ doesn't reject. On a practical level, what advice do you have for somebody in terms of keeping on top of taking their medication? They're very important. You know, this is how I see it. I've been on dialysis. I am given an organ, which I need to make it work, survive it, do whatever I need to do to keep it so I don't go back to where I was. I advise keeping up on your medications is very extremely important. Sometimes my medications get delivered to me. So a few hours (laughs) will pass or there was a couple of times a day would pass. I would be very worried, extremely worried, very afraid of these things because there's flashbacks that happen of what I used to be, the situation that I was in. So keeping up with your medications is extremely important. You have an organ, you're given an organ. So this is another chance of life. You have to take care of it and taking care of it is those medications and, of course, what you eat, drink, and how you do your daily life matters. So reflecting what you just said in terms of what you eat, drink, and live your daily life, it matters. So what type of things do you do to safeguard your kidney? So the first ones are the medications. I always take them on time. Second is how not how, what I be eating. I try to stay away from all those, how do you call it in England? Is it called fast food, carbohydrate? I try to stick with vegetables, fruits, home-cooked meals. I drink plenty of water. Sometimes when I don't drink, they did tell me if you don't drink water, like your body needs to flush out the medications. Keeping your system, you know, clean. I do drink water. My workout lifestyle, I, I'm not really a gym person, but I do do my treadmills and I do, when the weather is nice, I do take my walks. So these are the things that I do to keep up with my kidney. <laughs> Definitely good things all around there because it is so important for everyone to take care of your body full stop, you know, whether that's the eating, the drinking, the exercise, it all Mm -hmm. works together for a Mm -hmm. healthier life. So while we're on the subject of transplantation and organ donation, we have a system in England which is opt out. So everyone is, is assumed to be an organ donor after their death unless they opt out and some people do opt out. But what I wanted, as somebody who has received a kidney through organ donation, what would you have to say to people who are like, I don't think I want to be an organ donor and are thinking about opting out? What would you say to that person? So there's two options or two choices, however you want to phrase it. There's a living donor and there is a deceased donor. A living donor, as as we all know, we have two kidneys and we can function perfectly with just one kidney. The other kidney can help another person who was me a year and a half ago to survive. And if you're going to be able to live perfectly and, you know, and make another person survive a life, why not? You should always, maybe not should, but you can speak to your doctors and suggest it and you hear what they say. The other option is a deceased donor. A deceased donor, as I think what Dee was saying, is they can be put as opt-in, like when they're deceased, they can donate their organ. In this situation, my donor was a deceased donor. He was a 22-year-old male who passed away in a car accident. It was a nice family. I heard their story. I wasn't able to meet them, but the doctor told me, like, you know, briefly who and what they are. Very nice people who always just want to help others. 
and him passing away, there's nothing there for him, for his body at least, but to make other people survive, to make other people, you know, to give other people life. In this case, he gave me that kidney and he will die with me. I will always remember him. I, you know, forever grateful to my God and him. Because if it wasn't for this young boy, I would still be on that list probably. So I would always say, why not opt in for, you know, for a deceased donor to be a deceased donor? And why not even doing as a living donor? So I know that you're active on social media. So for anyone who wants to follow you, what are your handles? So I have my Instagram is my name, Sinet, S-E-N-E-T-H-T-X-R-E-A-L-T-O-R. And my Facebook is Sinet, S-E-N-E-T, space K, space I-D-R-I-S-S. Please reach out to me. I am here to answer any questions I can. I always just want to motivate people and inspire people and keep keep you all positive. That's the wonderful thing about the kidney community. So inspiring and people so willing to help others. And as I always do, I'll be putting those handles in the description box. So please do give Sunet a follow and support. Thank you. I appreciate you all. (laughs) So what is your final word of encouragement for the listeners? Please stay positive. Stay positive, stay positive, stay positive. I don't know how many times I can say and repeat it over and over again. Stay positive. Things do get better. Life doesn't end at dialysis. It gets better. And that's how I survived my transmissions in life. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I know that by sharing your story, you will help so many people and encourage so many people. So thank you so much. I hope so. I hope I have. Thank you for having me here again. Thank you for listening to Diary of a Kidney Warrior podcast. And don't forget that you can contact me on social media using the handle Diary of a Kidney Warrior. Please do subscribe to the podcast and please do tell a friend. New episodes of this podcast are released every other Monday. Until next time, take care and choose to live. Diary of a Kidney Warrior, sharing faith, knowledge, hope and love.